welcome everyone here. Uh, these are the Thursday afternoon speaker series of the Division of Social and Transcultural Psychiatry uh, here at McGill. Privilege for us to have uh, Professor Peter Sterling uh, with us. He's a professor of neuroscience uh, at the University of P Pennsylvania. Uh, he has uh, had a long and distinguished career uh, in looking at um, uh, the brain and um, uh, neurocircuitry uh, in relationship uh, to um, a variety of uh, adaptive systems, fine scale structure of neural circuits, but also a great interest in um, uh, stress response and uh, uh, allostasis as we'll be hearing about and so on. Uh, he's also been, I think importantly, and of great interest to us, uh, very active uh, in, uh, in the community and in political life as an advocate, as a person uh, working for uh, equity and, and uh, addressing some of the you know, serious challenges in our societies. Uh, and I think that's, um, even though these are maybe separate domains of intellectual activity and work in some ways, I think there's been an interesting cross talk and particularly in some essays and reflections that he's published more recently. So, and as I mentioned, was mentioning just before he came on that the uh, part of the um, sort of um, stimulus to in inviting him uh, right now was uh, uh, reflecting on this book, which Anna and I have been reading and discussing uh, a little bit, uh, also because we're involved in a project called the Canadian Framework for Brain Health, which is trying to articulate ways of thinking about the brain and neuroscience research um, uh, and its implications, the implications of current research for public policy and health policy, trying to develop ways of thinking about it that are critical and, and uh, better informed than what tends to happen, which is just the latest exciting piece of research gets touted and it's presented as though it's going to solve all kinds of things and it doesn't necessarily engage with the complexities and the the situated nature of the of the dilemmas that we're dealing with in in health and other walks of life so with that little bit of framing i'm i'm uh i i would like very much to just turn it over to you peter to um to uh, take the floor and let us know how you'd like to structure this in terms of uh your own presentation and look forward to uh the discussion with you well, thanks, thanks very much for this uh, uh, kind introduction. I'm delighted to be there. I'm, I'm very eager to, to get people to read the book. I tried to write it with some science, but not too hard. And, um, and I've made the offer everywhere I do talk is that if, if a group of people get together and they, uh, and they wanna discuss the book like a chapter a week or something, I'm, I'm doing this with some students in Amsterdam, I'd be glad to visit. Uh, either at the end or intermediate times. I mean, uh, this is a good use of my time is talking to people who are interested uh, in the book. I am bringing up, I, I just completed uh, uh, a translation into Spanish uh, yesterday. It's at this publisher in uh, where I live. And um, so I'm excited about that. And uh, yeah, and uh, feel free to share my email. I mean, I have a lot of links to essays on my email. If anybody wants to communicate with me, uh, I, I'm eager to do that. So uh, with that, why don't I, I go to the PowerPoint and share my screen and get on with it, okay? Uh, there we go. Okay, so the, the title is the same as, as my book that, that, that we mentioned. And I start by, noting that my lab focused on this fine scale neurocircuitry leading ultimately to this book with Simon Laughlin in, in Cambridge. Um, and uh, the idea of this book was that the brain is smarter than a supercomputer, but uses a uh, hundred thousand fold less energy in space. And this is fostered by the body of course must also be efficient. It's 80% of our total energy. And to achieve this, the brain predicts needs and regulates physiology and behavior to meet them. Joseph Iyer and I call this allostasis, meaning stability through change, to contrast it to homeostasis, which means holding everything constant. Um, so we re recently updated the story uh, in Trends in Neurosciences. And, uh, and so this led, it, led me to uh, this new book, What is Health?, which asks, what does our species, our human species, need for a, for a healthy life? And can we achieve this with drugs? And, and why, for example, did, did Homo sapiens brain invest in art? It doesn't provide any calories. Um, it doesn't move us along in any uh, uh, obviously practical way. So why, why, did this, why did our brain invest evolution invest so much in art and music and dance and so on? 
And then the question is, I'm qualified to talk about circuits, but maybe uh, what about what about culture and 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 these sorts of things? And the answer, my answer is that it was a, there was an interplay between my laboratory um, work and my social activism. And so the book and this talk reflect how I've lived. This was my first scientific report uh, in, uh, at Cornell University, Ithaca, New York in 1961. Uh, upon submitting it, I left Ithaca for Mississippi to join the Freedom Rides. And that was 61 years ago this month. And so many of you may be forgiven if you don't remember exactly what that was. But the idea was that, um, that um, at that time in the US, um, there was racial segregation in, in interstate travel, in fact, in all travel in, in the South. And the idea was to um, travel uh, whites and blacks together. Uh, they would be, we would be arrested and we would fill the jails ultimately in Jackson, Mississippi. And, um, uh, and that would force the uh, Kennedy administration, uh, John Kennedy and his brother, Robert, to, to, uh, to uh, integrate interstate travel. And so uh, in, in this short film clip, uh, I'm on a train, I'm 20 years old, I'm sitting, this is my seatmate, uh, and, I, and the, I, I was interviewed, I discovered this film a few years ago, and this is, whoops, uh, this is me. Uh, How about you? Can you give me any of your feelings on why you want to take part in this? Well, I want to help establish the right of all Americans to be together and to travel together. Why do you think it's your responsibility? I think it's every American's responsibility. I only think that some are more conscious of their responsibility than others. Okay, so um, about 30 minutes later, we got off the train, we were arrested, uh, and uh, this, we were processed. Um, this is my mugshot, and it's now on my, on my uh, email and my Twitter account. So my concern for social justice persisted, and, uh, and now, by now, it's the mid-1960s. I'm in Cleveland, Ohio at Western Reserve University as a graduate student studying motor pathways from the cerebral cortex to the spinal cord and brainstem. And um, here, here's the corticospinal uh, pathway to the spinal cord. And I'd slip away from my microscope um, to, to canvas door-to-door -door in Central, which was the poorest black ghetto in Cleveland. And the people who answered my knock were often partially paralyzed, limping, sagging face, uh, slurred speech. And back in the lab, I learned that the, the immediate cause was the destruction of pathways by stroke from chronic hypertension. I recall that my grandfather had lived in Central when it was a Jewish ghetto. Uh, he was a house painter in a Jewish union, and he too suffered hypertension and early stroke. So I began to think that maybe hypertension is related to social tension. So fast forward to my own uh, laboratory uh, a little bit later at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. I was still slipping away, but now to the library to seek evidence for the causes of hypertension. Um, hypertension, by the way, is, is high, just simply a uh, fancy name for high blood pressure, chronic high blood pressure. I was also devouring ethnographic studies to learn how other people lived. And soon I was slipping away to, uh, to visit indigenous communities in Central America. And now I live half of each year in, in the mountains of Western Panama, sugar cane. So here's what I learned. First, that blood pressures of foragers, horticulturalists are low and they're steady with age. And this is, this is, for example, this Nobe uh, indigenous family waving to us lives on the, on the, in Panama on the Caribbean slope, two days walk from the nearest market. This is also true for similar groups in Southeast Asia, South America, and Africa. But in the US, blood pressures rise as children enter school. So this graph shows on the horizontal axis age and systolic blood pressure on the vertical axis and, um, and what you see is that the, the uh, immediately as children enter school around age six, leave home, um, their blood pressure start to rise. And by graduation, 25% are in the hypertensive range. So this reflects sustained physiological arousal. Um, the rise is steepest for African-Americans who were the most stressed 
And that's because in the US, uh, black lives still don't matter. Now, um, this is a, a, a recording, a 24 hour recording in one individual who has a little tube in his arm, a cannula in, in an artery. And uh, this, is, um, this is noon, this is midnight. And this is arterial pressure, systolic and diastolic. And what this shows is that blood pressure is not something you have. Doctors say you have 120 over 80 blood pressure, but it's, it's not the case. It's really fluctuating all over the place uh, for, in response to each change in mental state. And so, for example, um, this is uh, three o'clock in the afternoon and the individual is dozing at a lecture. His pressures come way down. This, he's struck with a pin, stuck with a pin. He awakens, the brain pre predicts danger, raises the pressure. He, he looks around, discovers it's a prank. His, his pressure falls back down and goes back to sleep. And then there are these various unidentified um, peaks and valleys. And at midnight here, um, uh, this is an identified peak uh, preceding sex. He becomes sexually aroused and his brain predicts the need to raise the pressure to support his activity. Then, then at night, uh, in, after, after sex, he, he sleeps and his um, pressure comes way, way, way down. And the next day uh, in the morning up till noon, it rises again to cope with his day. So this is allostasis. Uh, it, the brain recognizes the context, predicts the need, and adjusts the pressure to match. It provides uh, just enough, just in time. This is a, a slogan from Toyota's assembly line, but, but uh, biology uh, figured it out uh, several billion years ahead, earlier. So I want you to note the wide dynamic range from very low to very high, and that it's exquisitely responsive. And this is health. I, I consider a definition of health is responsiveness to what's going on outside and inside uh, our head and body. So arteries adapt to predicted mean pressure. This is the record I just showed you where the average pressure is around 100 millimeters of mercury. And this is what the arteries would look like. They have, they have uh, sort of modestly, uh, modest walls with, with muscles lining them, but with the healthy open and lumen for blood to flow. This is a, a record of someone who has chronic hypertension with a pressure, a me, a mean pressure of around 160. And this is what the arteries look like. The artery, the, the muscles in the arteries when they're subjected to chronically high pressure, hypertrophy, just like your skeletal muscles do to lifting weights. And they eventually they begin to occlude the, uh, the lumen and, and you get arterial um, sclerosis. So um, all the mechanisms for blood pressure are controlled by the brain. This is what I learned in the library. Um, the brain, first of all, controls the kidney. It has nerve fibers to go on endocrine cells in the kidney that control uh, the amount of salt water that the kidney pumps into the blood uh, to control the plasma volume. It controls the heart rate and strength of contraction. And the two of these combine to control the cardiac output. If you put the cardiac output through uh, the arterial vessels that who, uh, have a resistance to them, you, uh, you end up with a particular pressure. And so the brain is in charge of all this. Moreover, the brain controls your appetite for salt. And doctors will tell you, you know, don't eat too much salt. We shouldn't we eat. But in fact, the brain decides how much salt we need and, um, and drives us to seek it. So, um, so J.P. Henry, who studied this for many years, concluded that psychosocial arousal induces salt appetite, making a society's salt consumption a measure of its social stress. Now, drugs can block each of these mechanisms, but the brain compensates. So for example, we give a uh, doctor will give you a uh, diuretic to cause, your, uh, to cause your kidney to shed salt water into the urine and reduce the plasma volume. But, if, but the brain says, I know where the pressure wa I want it to be, and it increases the heart rate. So then we can give a drug to block that. A beta blocker is a commonly used. And uh, the brain will say, fine, but I'm going to increase the uh, resistance in the vessels. And we can block that too. And so what happens is that it's possible to control the pressure, but now the system can't respond to new uh, predictions. 
And I, I'm old. I walk with some old guys uh, to, you know, for exercise and companionship. And many of them are taking uh, particularly beta blockers. And it's fine until we come to a slope, a, a gentle rise. And then it, it's impossible for their heart to increase the cardiac output. So we have to slow down and, and rest. The beta blocker, and all of these drugs affect multiple points uh, in, in the body. This is, this is just true for every single drug. They're not side effects, they are effects. And a beta blocker, for example, affects, uh, raises blood glucose, and so it, it exacerbates any existing uh, or uh, type 2 diabetes or anything close to it. So you can then treat uh, that, of course, with more drugs. And the result is uh, a basically is an ill patient who is stabilized precariously by polypharmacy. And so uh, now that's all physiology I want to say right now. So I want to switch gears and consider some problems with U.S. health. And uh, I know I'm speaking to Canada, but uh, you know, uh, whatever we suffer, you're likely to be next. Um, and, uh, and connect this to some aspects of our neural design and, and discuss what we need to do. Now, one of the uh, important statistics is that deaths of despair, by which uh, we define as, so, uh, as um, as uh, overdose from drugs, poisoning from alcohol, and suicide um, are, are rising, have risen sharply in the U.S. over quite a few years, but very, very sharply from for, for the last 20 years. And this is this is a this is a curve representing U.S. whites, but but there are you know equivalent statistics for other ethnic groups and and, and so on. This is these are whites now of middle age, born in 1970. And, um, and there you can see that their death rates from these deaths of despair are rising. Now, um, the rate in the US is fourfold greater than the steeper than this curve for males with no education beyond high school. And in the US, that's 60% of white males. In the US down here, you can see that Canada uh, and, and the UK and Australia are showing a less severe trend, but it's, it's, it's in the same direction. Now, another way to look at it is, is um, by cohort. And so the cohorts, these older cohorts, I'm the cohort of 1940, um, and we're doing okay toward the end of our life, not that much despair. By 1950, uh, it's getting worse. And so this is the cohort uh, of 1970 that I just showed you. It crosses this line of 100 deaths per 100,000 at about age 45. 10 years later, the 1980 cohort crosses the same line at about age 35. And if we plotted the subsequent cohorts here, it get, the, the curve gets steeper and steeper. So there's a real crisis now in the US. At the same time, obesity is rising from what I call foods of despair. That is um, uh, sweet and, and despair over the same period, corresponding to this period. Um, and I call these murders of despair, these mass shootings. And these are murders that gun control, this is the despair that gun control is not going to cure. So the question is, what causes our collective despair? And first, uh, consider our huge brain. Um, the human brain is three and a half times that size of a chimpanzee, which is our nearest surviving relative. And, um, and it grows slowly in childhood using 60% of our total energy. And that's, that's really why our body grows so slowly until adolescence, because most of the, most of the, uh, the energy and, and resources are going to grow the brain. Now, this, is a, this graph, I think, I'm beginning to think is one of the most important graphs that, that explains human evolution. Age is on the bottom, and this is net production of calories on the vertical axis. And what it shows is that, um, that uh, the growth of a large brain requires care by two adult generations, because um, at, at, um, at birth, we have, we're sucking, we're not producing any, we're just sucking up calories. All through our childhood, we're sucking up more and more calories. And, and only by age 20 do we, we about cross this line and, and take care of ourselves. So any of you who have 
Uh, teenagers don't expect very much. We, we, we didn't evolve that way. Um, and then look what happens. At, at 20, the hunter-gatherers uh, go off into the, into the environment with their elders, and they learn how to find food, either by hunting it or gathering it or you know, uh, growing small crops. And, and I think the, the, the key thing here is, look, this, this continues, their skill, their productivity continues up to about age 45, and then it stays high, uh, and only after, way after age 60 uh, does it begin to cross the line of dependency again. So, um, so productivity that peaks after 45 um, means that for 200,000 years, gathering and hunting were challenging careers um, that demanded prolonged study and practice. And that lent meaning to our lives. So the second point about the brain is that everyone is different. The brain specializes to conserve energy and space. And this is something I came to preach uh, appreciate uh, working on the book with, uh, with Simon Laughlin. So this is the view of the left hemisphere. Every square centimeter is, is occupied by some specific circuit. We have about 200 specialized circuits, but once we have that, basically we, we can improve our own individual intelligence because the, the territory is, is occupied and, and the, the skull is full. What we could do is to give each brain a unique set of these circuits and a different circuits for each brain. And so that confers each individual in the community with a set of innate abilities. We practice our innate abilities because that is what is most rewarding. And so um, this is what produces a community of experts, a hunter, a healer, a gatherer, um, a, an artist, and so on, a navigator. And so communal intelligence outcompetes a design where everyone is the same. And this makes us awesome as a species, but there are costs and you, you know them well, that one is mental distress from somehow from our, our, our individual strangeness and also interpersonal conflict. So, but the problem is that to benefit from communal intelligence, we must cohere. And so this is achieved by various sacred practices, what, what words alone cannot express. So the brain, this is why the brain invested, I think, in costly circuits that go well beyond collecting our food. And so an uh, example uh, is we, we made cave art. This is, a, this is the earliest known example of cave art from 44,000 years ago. Um, and uh, it looks pretty much to me like uh, the minute we, we arrived as a species, we were, we were painting uh, on caves and and, uh, and devoting resources to do that because the, the artists who painted this uh, or artists were highly skilled and they must have been supported by other members of the community uh, to do this work. We also uh, began to make music. This is a 40,000 year old uh, flute. And, and so these, these activities elicit intense emotions of awe, cooperation. So after 200,000 years, communal intelligence produced, guess what, a steam engine. And, um, and that Im immediately drove an immense uh, increase in, in uh, industrial production. This is CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. This is a uh, year. And you see that the introduction of steam engine just immediately triggered this, this soaring rise of CO2. And we have not managed to to turn this curve around yet, and it's, it's, we're in trouble. So industry also shrank the opportunities for challenging activities. And this was recognized almost immediately by Adam Smith, the father of economics. He said, uh, the man whose life is spent performing uh, a few sim simple operations has no occasion to exert his understanding or exercise his invention. He naturally loses the habit of such exertion and generally becomes as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for a human creature to become. Well, I, I don't think we've become stupid. Actually, the problem is that we're still smart, but we've narrowed the possibilities to exercise our innate gifts. So we evolved to explore the planet and we did. We're coming out of Africa. We got to every, every continent in no time. And now multitudes among us have to punch a ticket or scan a barcode. And this 
jobs learned in minutes or days pre present insufficient challenge uh, to, to, uh, to animals like us who have this gigantic brain. So I think it's the mismatch between our abilities and our opportunities to exercise them that causes despair. So what links despair to compulsive consumption? We inherited a circuit that drives seeking. Uh, the circuit rewards an unpredicted find with, a, uh, with the pulse of dopamine. And uh, here's an example. This is a, a dopamine uh, signal and a neuron. It's firing away action potentials. And when the reward is unpredicted, you get this spike, extra spikes, an extra pulse of dopamine. And when we get a pulse of dopamine, we, we are, are, our experience is a pulse of satisfaction that allows us a pause in our seeking. But as the pulse dissipates, we, we re must resume seeking to serve the next need. This is the design of the circuit. Foragers find food unpredictably, a root, a rabbit, a berry, and so on. Each, for each one of these finds, they get a pulse of dopamine. They find comfort also unpredictably, a, a dry cave, a warm fire, uh, something like that. Uh, and they get uh, frequent pulses of dopamine because most of their life is uh, unpredictable. Um, we find food and comfort predictably without effort or surprise. And of course, it's very convenient, but predicted, these predicted uh, rewards don't provide much dopamine. And so here's the same neuron when, when the reward is predicted. And you can see that there's just very little response, no dopamine. So lacking frequent pulses, this is, we need these pulses uh, to, to feel comfortable and, and lacking them, we grow restless and we search for a surprise. And so when, the, when food is predicted, when you know where you can get it in the supermarket uh, or in a restaurant, the main surprise is more and richer. And, and the problem is, so you get these surges of sugar and fat, which cause surges of dopamine. And uh, I'm not making this up, this is, this is well documented. And, but then if the surprise is more, the next surprise must be even more. And we go from a Mac to a Big Mac to a Whopper. And, and the brain adapts to each of these surges by reducing its sensitivity because that's the design of the brain. Any, any increase in something is, causes a, a, a counter reduction of sensitivity. It's the same story for drugs. Alcohol, nicotine, cocaine, amphetamines, and opioids all evoke these surges of dopamine to which we soon adapt. Drug addiction, I wanna say here um, very firmly, uh, I think it's a, a drug, drug addiction is not a substance use disorder. It is not a, uh, not a disorder in any way. The, the initial consumption of a drug or, or rich food is a natural effort to escape our despair, to find some dopamine. The next part is the escalating use which is, uh, which is a natural adaptation of neural circuits. This is what they do, okay? Um, so, uh, yeah. So just as our retina, which I studied for many years, adapts to more light by reducing its sensitivity. If you wanna see the stars, you have to go out and, and dark adapt. When we get more light, the retina turns its sensitivity down and that's what the, that is what is at issue with all of these other um, processes. So uh, I'd like to summarize, uh, health I think is responsiveness, it's adaptation to continual change. It involves predicting future needs and that minimizes effort and that's why it's efficient. We reduce the errors. Allostasis includes all processes that produce, uh, that support predictive change. And the first cell that evolved billions of years ago had a, a molecular clock to predict what time to make its DNA. Because uh, if you make it during the sunlight, uh, sun, the, the ultraviolet destroys the DNA. So the clock predicted when night would come and time to, time to uh, begin producing, to reproduce. The first brain was a worm, a marine worm, and it, it predicted all its own needs and it learned where to find the resources. It remembered where to go. And, uh, and that's the brain that we, uh, that was the, the ancestor of our brain. And it had it had this dopamine circuit in it right then. So, so these molecular and neural circuits were optimized by half a billion years ago. And now we're tweaking them with drugs to fix the problems that uh, arose over the last 200 years. 
right? Drugs that block these ancient signaling pathways reduce responsiveness. So we treat despair, addiction, obesity, type two diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease at the molecular level, not to speak of uh, all sorts of mental disturbances with a panoply of drugs. But polypharmacy is not a plausible route to health and it's very, very expensive. So I think that our brain evolved for, for individualized lives of physical, cognitive, emotional, and spiritual responsiveness, learning across the lifespan. And it is our responsibility to live such lives and to, to help others live them. Now, one more comment is that what I think it requires is everybody has to be included. Everybody has to feel that their lives actually matter. Reducing inequality reduces the stress and despair and thus improves health. Health requires that we practice our gifts across the lifespan. Automation, of course, is progressively reducing job qualities. And what we need is not more jobs, but we have to provide now new sources of challenging activity. Health requires expanding our sacred practices to relieve tensions that are caused by our innate mutual strangeness. And so now we're we, we click for these products of sacred practice. You, with a click, you can get Spotify, Netflix, ESPN, Pornhub, and so on. But, um, but vicarious experience cannot substitute for participation. You know, you, uh, we, we have to do these things for themselves. And so the, 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 the fourth point is that health re requires rebuilding our communities and finding new forms of communal life because for our species, that is also a key source of our essential, do our essential dopamine. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm open for questions. That's terrific. Thank you for giving such a, a far reaching and uh, incisive account of our, uh, our evolutionary history and our current predicament. Uh, I think that uh, many people here will have comments and reflections. So uh, let me turn it open to uh, open it up to everybody here, please. Go ahead and you can um, either raise your hand or put a, a comment in the chat or uh, unmute yourself. We, uh, we probably won't have too many collisions. We're not such a large group, so. How do you think uh, AI will change these dynamics? Uh, yeah, um, I did a, uh, so on my link of my, uh, my email, uh, this, I did a podcast with two people and who were interested in AI. We discussed that. Well, I think um, to, the, to the extent that AI relieves us of having to do anything or, uh, or think, uh, it's not going to be good. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there's no reason why we can't uh, you know, uh, I, I don't think there's anything intrinsic about AI that prevents us from, from being creative. We, we can find new ways of being creative. Um, yeah, no, I don't see any particular issue. Except, except for automation, you have to deal with it. We're automating rapidly. We have to find other stuff for people to do. But I mean, that, that really, you, the example of automation really clarifies it again, I think. There's nothing intrinsic in automation uh, that's problematic for people, but losing meaningful jobs is problematic. And if it's, if it's economically efficient for someone who's not thinking about the big picture, but is just concerned with a more approximate goal, you know, that's what's driven this whole process. And similarly with AI, I mean, AI could be a platform for people to do much more intellectually challenging and engrossing things. But if it's used mainly to figure out how do we, uh, you know, optimize uh, consumption, um, then uh, we get more of the same. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, uh, this is that we're in a very dangerous time and uh, the people have to take over, take back what, you know, take back our lives. And the people who are standing in the way of these, gigantic corporations that have ruined agriculture, that have ruined industry, have ruined cooperative work, and, uh, and they're gonna keep at it until we elect some people uh, who, can, who can turn it around. And this is very urgent. I, I, I talked to some high school students yesterday and I said, you know, it's your time, get out there and get, you know, elect some decent people. And, you know, this is what we have to do. Uh, you know, you, you tell the story like it, it, in place of uh, Richard Dawkins' selfish gene, we have the selfish dopamine circuit. 
uh, kind of that you know because that's the the bottleneck or that's the you know the thing that uh, that valences everything and that um, um, how you know that leaves us with a certain kind of vulnerability uh, which has been capitalized on in many ways. So how do we really work with that in some way? Well, I think um, I think it's not the, the the design of the dopamine circuit appeared half a billion years ago in this worm. The reason we still have it is because it was so brilliant. It basically it's mathematically uh, optimal. Uh, my one of my neighbors. I live in the summertime in, in Amherst, Massachusetts. One of my neighbors uh, is Andy Barto, who's a guy who who understood the the underlying mathematics of this. And you can't design a more optimal system. And one of the points in my book is almost every, all our biochemistry, all our carbohydrate metabolism, our lipid metabolism, our brain functions are optimized from the nanometer scale up to the you know, centimeter scale. So when you mess around with them, you're unlikely to improve these optimal systems. You're more likely to make them worse. Uh, I mean, if you, if you live, I mean, imagine going on vacation where you, you do a little, maybe do a little work, you have your, you play with your children, you grow, you have a garden, you go out into nature and you have, you know, activities that uh, basically, and you play your guitar, you compose some music, you paint the painting. My wife is uh, a painter. Um, and, uh, you know, actually uh, when I was in my twenties, I was very attracted to uh, Karl Marx and he, he had this line saying, when we live under communism, uh, finally, um, we will, we, I will paint, I will uh, hunt in the morning, I will fish in the afternoon, and I will write criticism in the evening. I find this, I have always found this very appealing, and sort of that's the way I'm able to live now. Um, uh, although I probably still work harder than I uh, should, except, but that is, that is, a, that is a, a human life. On the other hand, uh, if I get my cataracts out, uh, I want to get them out by a guy who does it, you know, 30 of them a day, day in, day out. You, I mean, there's a role for expertise, but there's also a role. We, we've, we've, we've greatly exaggerated our lives into these, uh, distorted them by, by these levels of expertise. We, we can find our way back into, into, the, uh, into a reasonable way of life. Other comments, or I have a few other things I can raise, but let's let please let's hear from some other people here. <clears throat> things you'd like clarifications, comments, questions. Um, I don't have the question formulated, but I'm since it's there's no one raising it, I'm just going to try. Hi, uh, Peter, this is Anna. Um, I contacted you um, at the, as part of setting this uh, talk up. Um, I, I was wondering how how you you speak of of the distress. Um, um, you speak more social distress and how it links to mental health. But I wonder if you've had any thoughts on on sort of how affect, affective regulation um, plays into some of what you've described and how how, um, or emotional regulation, whatever you want to call it. And if you could speak to that a little bit and expand on your thoughts on that, is there anything that you would say along the lines of um, effective allostasis as the, putting it out there? I'm just wondering if you've had any um, thoughts on that. Sure, um, yeah, um, <clears throat> let, let me, yeah, I'll answer your question now, but I'll make another point. Uh, yeah, we, we have these very complicated brains, and so um, and um, and that makes us vulnerable, as I, as I showed in those you know two monk monk slide and, and the uh, you know the Cain and Abel slide, and you know um, really the Old Testament, uh, the Judeo Christian you know uh, Old Testament describes story after story after story of human frailty problems that people get into. And, and the ways that they get out. And uh, when I read that, uh, I mean, I was raised in a leftist household, all talking about social levels and with that very little discussion of individual responsibility, individual morality and so on. And uh, I was in my forties before I, I realized, you know, I'm in trouble. <laughs> 
and I, I began to read the Old Testament and every story in Genesis uh, had me in tears because this described my own experience. Uh, for, for example, my experience of going in the Freedom Rides, people said, well, weren't you scared? I said, well, no, my father raised me to do that. And so we were like Abraham and Isaac, laying Abraham laying his son down to, to be sacrificed possibly. And when I read that, I was, I was very moved and, and I still am sometimes. I asked my father, did you understand that we were acting out this ancient story? He said, yes, he did. And he was uh, very scared. So I, I went through a period of, of realizing, you know, how my family worked, all the scheming and all the various complicated aspects. And I, I actually, uh, I began um, return to sort of my Jewish roots to understand some of this, some of this stuff. So I think, um, you know, this is a long answer to your question, but it was a complicated question. I think we have, we have evolved along with our big brains, we evolved um, these various social practices, which include social instruction, uh, how children learn how to behave uh, to each other and how to behave to uh, older people, how to behave in their environment. And uh, I think the current social, large scale social disruption has made those things difficult to, to uh, teach. And um, so I think we need to return to some, uh, some you know, I, I hate to use the word family values, but uh, I think in this case, uh, you know, I, I think I mean something serious. I think the, the other thing is that I think our education system is, uh, is really uh, abominable because it takes, in the US, 35 kids of all different abilities, all different interests and in, in native talents and crams them into a room and tells them to sit still and listen to the teacher for 45 minutes. Many of them can't do it because they're not designed to do it. They're out on some curve and um, uh, uh, they're looking for something else. We shouldn't be forcing everybody to do the same thing. We should take these kids to sc into school, try to discover, do some inquiry, what are their actually their innate talents and provide them opportunities to focus on those talents, teach them a little, you know, some basic skills, everybody has to read, be able to read and, and, and you know, add and subtract, but most of the rest of it isn't necessary uh, beyond what the children express. So, so I think we, we can grow much healthier children with a, with a healthier uh, educational system, which was really designed to put people into an industrial system, which we really don't need anymore. So, so that would be a key thing, you know, fix education. Uh, yeah, let me just, before I yield the floor, uh, uh, I, I do have another slide. I don't think it's necessary, but, but people, uh, when I show that death of despair rising like this, often people say, well, well what does Europe know? You know, wh why are they so much better off? And I have a slide that lists all the things that Europe and to some extent, a large extent, uh, Canada do, which is uh, prenatal care, postnatal care, uh, when uh, parents have time off, they have preschool, free preschool, they have free medical care, they have uh, pensions, they have, uh, in the US, there was no law that says you have to have a paid vacation. So in the US, 25% of workers don't have any time off. So you can go through the whole list of, of, uh, of uh, social uh, uh, supports that Europe does, and to some extent Canada does, and that, that the US doesn't, doesn't do. And it would be very easy for us to do it. You know, um, we just have to, it's just a couple of senators and representatives that are standing in the way, you know. Well, other other questions or comments? I'm I'm wondering. You guys see a lot of people. Uh, how are you doing with with the uh, you know the prescription of of uh, drugs, antipsychotics, antidepressants, and stuff like that? I, I see that as a real problem. Um, I, I don't I, I just don't see how you can fun people can function with three or four of those drugs. I mean, it's you know it's, it's like the hypertension. <laughs> what, what, what is your experience yeah. with? Uh, we all have our own. So a few of us are not everybody here is practitioners. There are a lot of people who are social scientists or working others, but there are several psychiatrists here and some psychologists. So 
I, I mean, I think, first of all, we most of us try not to have several drugs. Most of us try to find one thing that might be helpful to some extent. But I, and I'll pose this back to you. One of my concerns as a psychiatrist has been that we intervene with drugs and systems that are homeostatic or allostatic. So we're not really fixing something that's broken. We're shifting a set point or something in a regulatory system that pushes back against that. And there's old studies at McGill showing that antipsychotics, for example, cause a kind of denervation supersensitivity in dopaminergic uh, systems. So you can actually end up with worse psychotic symptoms after you're taken off this medication. And that to me has been a big anxiety, apprehension, concern about what's going on with psychiatric medications. Antidepressants would be another likely candidate for such things occurring. And we don't really study that very much. And it's kind of buried in the big change, social changes where, you know, medications are embraced and so on. And that's something I've also witnessed over the course of my career. When I was an undergraduate in psychology in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, there was a lot of uh, concern about medications. I remember an article in Science by um, I think Judith Rabkin talking about the you know problems of medications and so on. But we we're living we live through a cultural change in which suddenly medications are much more acceptable um, as a kind of you know uh, fix or, or palliation or whatever. And so I do have serious concerns. I'm posing this to you partly as a social critic and trying you know using an evolutionary biological perspective to think about human adaptation, but also as a neuroscientist and who understands a lot about these circuits and, and who introduced the idea of allostasis, whether that, whether that can, whether you share that concern, what you think and, and why it's hard to get people to take that seriously, why there's such pushback that we're somehow we really are fixing things. Psychiatry still hopes that we're going to have these pharmacological solutions for things that, uh, you know, even if they are neuro neurobiological, they're biological at the level of circuits, not at the level of synapses for the most part. So anyway, what are your uh, thoughts? Well, I, I, I think that the, basically there's no rationale, there's no rationale for giving any of these drugs. I mean, our depression, I mean, the claim was we're depressed because our serotonin is low or our dopamine is low. This isn't true. There's no evidence for that. Um, and so most of the drugs that are, are, get, are given are not because of, there's mental disorders. Well, we, I think that the, the genome-wide studies that are coming out now, um, which I try to follow, what they're showing is that, that um, the circuits that drive our cognition and our emotion, really um, there's, there's a tremendous variability, as I've said. And there's some people that are out on the tail just the way there are tall people, there's seven foot tall people, but they're not disordered. They just got the genes for tall. And so there, we have these heterogeneous circuits. Um, and if you're out on the 1% of, of, of a, a circuit that's associated with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, you're going to suffer and people around you will suffer. But uh, that is not evidence that there's a dysfunction and a disorder. And I think that People who are selling that basically, uh, you know, uh, are just wrong. And usually, this, you know, it's it's been, one of my scientist friends talked about the uh, the uh, uh, industry, and I think that I think the academic parts, many of of neuroscience, is just feeding into the big pharma uh, and 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 the, and the government funding agencies. Uh, to sell drugs for which there is no rationale. I mean, for example, I, I, I studied this paper that came out uh, yesterday uh, in, I think, Nature Medicine, big high status thing, talking about uh, psilocybin. That's a new thing. Michael Pollan has given us psilocybin. I mean, um, there's, there's not a reason in the world to think that psilocybin is going to improve people's depression. I mean, you might find somebody who says, yes, it helped me. But of course, when you find somebody who says, yes, it helped me, that is just a, a case account. It doesn't, it doesn't compare to, uh, to, uh, to uh, double blind studies. And uh, so now they're saying, this paper said psilocybin is disconnecting a, a unitary, it's, it's connecting unitary areas of the brain across things. And that's what's causing it. This is all basically to, you know, if you pardon me, bullshit. These people are making this up. And how 
how they got this thing published in science, I don't know, but people are, re I mean, your nature, people are ready to hear this, to think that the problems we face can be solved with a drug. Same thing, uh, we're gonna solve obesity. I, I follow the, uh, the metabolic literature. Oh, here's a new, here's a new uh, biochemical uh, uh, pathway that uh, affects appetite. Well, okay, this is a new druggable target to cure obesity. People are eating themselves to death because they're trying to fill the hole in their heart and they try to do it by filling their stomach. This, this is not going to be cured by, by, uh, by drugs. And so I think the whole, basically, the whole medical uh, industry now uh, is, uh, is just veering on, on the edge of some sort of insanity, really. And, and they need to be turned around. I'm very eager to give my talk and uh, get my book to pre-medical students so they can read it uh, before they go to medical school because then they'll ask better questions and challenge some of the same, same thing uh, with insulin. When you, when you have uh, uh, so much carbohydrate circulating that you have so much insulin circulating, your insulin receptors turn down their sensitivity. What is, what is medical uh, doctors call that insulin resistance? Is there something bad about insulin that's it's, it's resisting <laughs> Uh, the body is resisting it. This is nonsense. It's, it's insulin receptors that are adapting to its high levels, just the way the eye adapts to bright light. So, uh, no, I think uh, I think the problem of drugs uh, is, uh, and the idea that we can solve our existential problems with medicine is just completely wrong. Yeah. So, th thank you for that. Um, Bruce Alexander, I think, is the same guy who uh, published his papers in the late 70s called Rat Park. His idea is, is if, you, if you raise rats in, in a large colony, which is their normal way of doing, they have stuff to play with and they can mate at, at will and they play games and so on, that they, will, um, they are less likely to, uh, to, uh, to eat, uh, to drink a morphine solution than rats that are raised in an isolated cage. And he published several papers on this, and they're really, you know, amazing. And um, so uh, he started off the idea that um, animal uh, interest in dopaminergic dopamine evoking drugs um, is correlated with their their own despair, their own isolation, and so on. So I, I spent a lot of this week actually looking to see what had happened to his his papers since 1980. And it turns out, you know, some, there were diff some technical difficulties. Now people do experiments dif differently. So I just finished this morning a review of all of the experiments uh, since his work on, on the social integration that protects us from, from addiction. And, you know, he might have gotten a few things that didn't, didn't last, but basically he got it right. And I think there's a lot of um, agreement now in the field that um, that our social a, a rich social life is a is a basically a, a decent protection against an interest in in in, uh, in, in intoxicating drugs. You know? uh, so uh, yeah, as I go, you know, as I I've been giving talks on college campuses. You know, I was at Notre Dame last week and University of Virginia, and I've been at Stanford and Berkeley and so on. If you walk around a college campus where both the young people and the, and the faculty are deeply engaged in activities that interest them, and they are they are doing their equipment of hunter gatherer. Um, then they're all pretty much looking trim and fit and sober, and uh, and you know that isn't to say everybody is you know, perfect, but basically, uh, if you're engaged in these ways that Alexander talks about, you're much less likely to be. Uh, facing any of these health health issues, from hypertension to addiction, yeah, yeah, I think he's done a lot of a lot of good. He has a, a, a book called "The Globalization of Addiction: uh, A Study in the Poverty of Spirit," which sort of takes that you know the kind of experimental work you're talking about and sort of projects it onto the large 
uh, you know, can, the, the large canvas that you've been talking about. And I guess in the phrase poverty of spirit, he's, he's alluding to some of the very same things you've been talking about in terms of meaningful engagement with things that really require us to use all our faculties. And, yeah. 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 Other comments. I, I'm curious. A lot of us here are quite interested right now in the modeling work in computational neuroscience and psychiatry that's going on, um, influenced by the work of Carl Friston that's using sort of this Bayesian brain idea of you know predicting the world. And we've been particularly directly involved with trying to extend that to talking about the social world and the idea that you know we human cognition is not just a thing that individual brains do, as you said, it's something we do cooperatively uh, and that maybe we can have a, a way of incorporating that into our ideas of, of uh, everyday function, brain function, and so on. So I'm curious as to, you know, the extent that you've, you know, looked at that literature, which comes at this from a, a very a different and maybe very general and uh, might say overly general, overly abstract level, but what, what your thoughts are about that? Uh, yeah, I, <clears throat> I've tried to read uh, Carl Fritz, Friston's papers in this area, and um, you know, I, I have an I have an interest in theoretical neuroscience, and I worked with a physicist for my last ten years on on optimality and stuff like that. But uh, to be honest, I cannot understand what he's talking about. <laughs> and I've asked my physics friend, uh, and he's and he's and so it's on our project is to sit down with some Friston papers and really work through them. But I I, I think. You know, he, he publishes about 200 papers a year and, uh, you know, and so if he'd, if he'd publish one that I could understand, I would, you know. but I would say in general, I'm interested, I think the brain is governed by these principles that use energy and space efficiently. For example, one of my last paper, two papers were about the, the diameter of axons in the optic nerve and in very large ones, uh, large diameter, and many, many smaller diameter. And of course, the, the, the space involved uh, uh, taken by an axon goes up as the square of its, of its diameter. And so one large axon can accommodate a gazillion small ones. The shape of this curve is the same for the optic nerve as, as for the pyramidal tract, as for the fornix, the output of the hippocampus. And so, um, so the brain is seriously designed to, to send some information very slowly by small axons and a few things fast by large axons. And of course, the energy use also goes as the square of the diameter. So I do care about these things, but I cannot understand. Uh, I, first of all, I think they're interesting. I don't think that they have much to do with human, uh, the, the problems that are facing us now, you know? And so I've sort of set those aside to focus, to shift gears and focus on these higher level issues, which I think are, are critical. Yeah. So. Well, I should mention there's a new book just out from MIT Press on uh, active inference and, and so on, uh, written by some of his colleagues. He acknowledges in the preface that he's not the one who did it because he couldn't write as clear an exposition. So that's, that's a, an entree into the modeling approach. We I'll send you a paper we have in behavioral and brain sciences called Thinking Through Other Minds. Okay. Uh, that tries to take this idea and say, fine, but human beings, again, are, you know, the last 50,000 years plus have been co social co-evolution. So m much of our cognition is really cooperative with other people. So can we use the same approaches, though, which, you know, have some elegance to them in terms of modeling and showing certain kinds of optimization? Can we use that to begin to talk about social processes? Uh, and that's where it might eventually make a bridge to say, so why do we get bad ideas that spread and that everybody subscribes to and you know our normativity doesn't always serve our best interests and so on sure. so. so i would say the person that i found very very interesting to read and very uh very uh understandable is uh, joe henrick he's a, yeah. he's a uh, yeah. anthropologist at harvard and um, yeah. uh, very clear uh, i'm forgetting the most recent book but um each each one of them is full of full of really good stuff, and he does experiments. I mean, he he, uh, he tries to figure out how you know from game. He uses game theory actually to uh, to investigate different cultures and so on. So that, that's something. But I, I will look at this new book too. 
Well, I think, and you're, I absolutely, I, I share your enthusiasm for John Henrik. And, and again, what's interesting about that work and what's different from the general modeling is his work is very historical in the end. It's very much about particular histories, particular paths that, you know, communities or populations have followed. And some of that might be for, you know, accidental or incidental reasons at a certain point, but it then begins to unfold, just like phylogeny begins to unfold, things have to build on where they were. And I think this, again, is part of our collective history. We sometimes paint ourselves into corners. And you could argue that we're in the midst of doing that right now with, with the global economic system. Well, I, yeah, so I, I do argue in my book, uh, uh, this issue of uh, are things really optimal? Did we get painted into a corner evolutionarily? And I, I think it's wrong. And I do, the first chapter is devoted to, to, uh, to saying the idea of optimality is not a Panglossian idea. This is, this is chemistry and physics. And so I do go into that. I, I don't think we're, I don't think we're trapped in a, there's no way out now. I just think th th there's a very clear way out. We have to, we have to take back control over consumption and levels of ways of living from, from the people who are, you know, really uh, profiting outrageously from it. And uh, it doesn't require, to get, to get back to where other countries are, U.S. doesn't require a Marxist revolution. It just requires taking some of the, some of the social product and sharing it with the people who are really right now suffering. And, and this, is, this is a no-brainer. We are not trapped. But we do have to get young people out there to uh, to to, get to vote and to get yeah. votes. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to put it that way because until very recently, I think here in Canada that we were a little bit smug that we, you know, we had a different sort of what we say different different sense of identity, different way of framing issues. So it was like with many countries in Europe, it was incomprehensible that the U.S. did not have universal medical care. Like, why would any society that had resources? not make this among their top priorities for why we form societies in the first place. So that was very hard to understand, but we do have a nascent uh, right-wing movement in Canada now that is being fed by some of the same you know, combination of, well, again, it's very important to understand what are those things? What are, the, what are the appetites? What are the framings of issues? And what are the social processes that amplify what look to be very bad ideas and very self-destructive ideas but this seemed to really get a grip on people. And, uh, you know, it's, this is a global, it's not just the U.S., although the U.S. has had its own fairly catastrophic recent, uh, you know, still ongoing dilemmas with that, but this is happening everywhere. It's happening throughout yeah. Europe, Southeast yeah. Asia, and so on. So, so I think, I mean, in the U.S., you can see very clearly who those people are, and those are the people who are suffering most. So you have to get to them, find out what their pain is, and you have to fix their sources of pain, and that will relieve everything. So I, there's a gentleman, uh, yeah, Francis Lou, yeah. Lou. Yes, Dr. Lou. Yes. Well, thank you very much for that stimulating talk. And I had uh, two questions. Um, the first one follows up exactly on what uh, Lawrence brought up, and that is this right-wing movement uh, that is uh, flooding the flooding the world right now, and um, and how does that, it's so counter to, you know, your sense of coherence and community and, and that, uh, that, that, that we really need. And this whole issue uh, in America of, um, you know, providing for the uh, safety net is a no brainer, but, you know, America just is behind the curve on all of that. And so what, is there a way of trying to understand this right-wing movement as uh, in terms of some uh, connection to the brain mechanisms that you've discussed? Is it, is it an aberration of allostasis or is it allostasis in another, in another aberrant way? Well, That's the yeah, first that, question. Yeah, okay, so let me do one at a time. Uh, uh, yes, I think it's a very good question, and I think it's a very helpful way to put it. Uh, I guess what I would look, I'm a, I'm a retinal scientist. I, uh, this is my opinion. I'm not an authority here, but my understanding is that uh, dopamine, uh, one of the sources of dopamine is human uh, unification and cooperation. We sing together, we go to church together, we hold hands together, 
and that's very important. Well, the right wing people uh, in the US now are, are doing those things together. It's just that they have, uh, they have machine guns. <laughs> I mean, uh, and, and their way of, and their way of uh, getting together is to be angry at somebody else. So um, no, I think they are getting, they wouldn't be doing it. If you're not getting dopamine from it, you're not gonna be doing it, okay? So they're getting, they're getting fed, but it's, it's in a very uh, counterproductive way. They're, they're avoiding the very things they need like jobs and education and so on. So, so how to figure out how to get, overcome that uh, is a huge challenge. And my guess would be intuitively, you guys are the mental health people, but you have to find some way to invite people. Uh, you have to offer them something that they need. And, and uh, if the uh, old people can't get it, offer it to the children. I mean, uh, so it's not, you're not gonna get it by beating them up. You're gonna get it somehow by feeding, uh, to, taking care of some of their pain. Yeah, That's very so. helpful. I, and I think a book that um, uh, I'm sure many on the, on the, um, in the room uh, would know about is uh, Jonathan Metzl's book that came out about three years ago called Dying of Whiteness uh, that analyzes the Trump supporters um, and the paradoxical uh, support of Trump when in fact, the Republican policies go counter to their actual needs. Um, and so, uh, but I think you've perhaps explained it that they're getting dopamine somehow by this resentment politics and, um, yeah, sure. and projection of uh, badness, you know, projection of evil out there and all of this is, is really supplying dopamine and, uh, and the right. communal, the communal spirit of uh, saving America and all of this. Right. Exactly, exactly. What's your other question? The other question was the cave art. I found that very intriguing. And of, I, of course, it made me think of the Werner Herzog film that came out about four, year, four or five years ago, The Cave of Forgotten Dreams. Right, and, right. and that whole question of why these people were doing this uh, cave art and what purpose does it serve? Right. And I'm just, I, 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 uh, one thing that I'm kind of working on is, is that cave art a source of, of uh, wonder and awe that somehow leads to a sense of uh, connectedness to the larger universe? Yeah, well, yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful thing that we can all speculate about. What, what I, so I noticed that, you know, the caves of Lascaux and Altamira those are famous, the French and the Spanish caves. Those are magnificent, but those were like uh, 20,000 years ago. These, some of these are way older. And, uh, and I mean, the, the, the one I showed from Indonesia is 44,000 years. I and mean, we were just barely wet behind the ears. The, 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 the cave hands on the, on the cover of my book um, um, are, are cave, from a cave painting and yeah, that's it. I love that. I love that image. Um, that's and the hands are the same, by the way. Where, wherever you go, I mean, people they're done by making, finding a, a pigment, ochre, typically grinding it up and using uh, hollow bones to blow stencils. That's the way they do it. They did it in in Indonesia. They did it in France. They do it in South America. And the the cave paintings, uh, uh, that cave painting is from the. Uh, it's called La, La Cueva de los Manos in, in, in Argentina, the, the Cave of the Hands. And it's dated to about 12, 10 to 12,000 years ago. That is when the first people arrived in those caves in, 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 in Argentina. And so I think it was just that this is the first thing that our species does. You get to a place, it's got a cave, and somebody says, you, I'll get the food, I'll get the dinner, you go start that painting, you know? And, um, I, you know, I don't know why, but it, it's such an immediate response. I, uh, when I was choosing the figures for the book, I, I was trying to think of, you know, uh, graffiti in, in tunnels, you know, all over Europe, all over the U.S. You go into a tunnel and there are these, these paintings and they're very, very skilled. It isn't just, a, you know, a desecration or anything. These are some kids, young people with an artistic bent, 1% of the population, 
they invest in cans of big cans of expensive paint and they go in and they do these phenomenal things. I looked around for, for a figure to use. I, I couldn't find, find some, right? But I think it's, I think what they're doing with this uh, uh, tunnel of graffiti is uh, they're, they're reenacting our, our very primal uh, uh, gifts. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have one, I'll make, we have a question from Elizabeth Quayer, but let me just ask one thing that follows up on the earlier question from, from Francis before we go to Elizabeth. Um, in talking about the idea that uh, Trump supporters or Viktor Orban supporters or whoever supporters uh, have, you know, uh, get this pleasant uh, and reinforcing experience uh, in a very analogous way that um, anybody else does for any other thing, whether it's having a donut or hugging a friend. Um, it, it seems to leave out the idea that there are other things going on that are part of the mix. And so specifically in this case, there, it seems to me that there's other circuitry, if you will, that's related to detecting danger. Uh, and threat of a certain kind, and that that is often more salient or overrides uh, things that are comfortable or pleasant. Uh, and because we have this problem of here, we have these media now, and we have this possibility, everybody has a megaphone if they have access to the internet. And so we have this kind of um, amplification and reproduction of anxiety provoking, fear provoking, uh, you know, threat messages. So it's not just antagonism toward the other, it's a way of, and in the politics of it and the rhetoric of it, it's very much framing the other as a danger, as a threat. You know, this is going to be child abuse. This is going to be Pizzagate. This is, you know, so, and that really grabs attention. If you have a pleasant message, a positive message, it might be a very good experience you're promoting, but it will not be a salient, at least in the initial attempt to grab somebody's attention as somebody else who's yelling fire, uh, you know, and so just to say this, well, only one example, I think we could talk about several other examples where there seem to be an intersection of several kinds of, uh, we call them biobehavioral systems or adaptive systems or something. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, absolutely. I mean, um, uh, when you are in a rage, you, it's not just dopamine, it's norepinephrine and adrenaline. And, well, you know, no, I mean, this. I, it's not the only chemical in the brain. And, you know, uh, I've certainly, I imagine I'm not alone, experienced moments of rage that uh, carry some satisfaction. You just feel alive, you know, and you're, you know, <laughs> you're ready to go. And, and um, yeah. so I, I understand that feeling. Um, yeah. And uh, it, yeah, well, I mean, this, look, I mean, there's a, there's a reason why our ancestors portrayed a lot of the world as a battle, battle between good and evil, light and darkness. You know, um, yeah, yeah. So, so let me just add two two additional things to that, and we'll go to Elizabeth. So, one is that, again, from a Canadian perspective, when we look at the U.S., it's a culture that valorizes anger in a particular way, and this is very much Trump's rhetoric that he comes across as a righteous, angry guy, even if he, you know, he, it's often foolish bluster, uh, and I, I think that privileges that that you know it, it gives a kind of um, what can we say, a kind of legitimacy and a kind of uh, confidence in, the, in that, that form of, of self-presentation. So I think that's a, a, an element of this whole thing that to me is important. And the other thing is that I'm reading this book by Jonathan Harry called Stolen Focus, and where he's talking about what happened in the design of the internet uh, and the economics of that, where basically the idea is people are monetizing uh, public attention. So the idea is, can we grab as much attention as possible? And they've deliberately taken the idea that, well, what's going to grab attention much more is fearful, disturbing things. People will spend much more time looking at those uh, because it's adaptive in the long run. You know, figuring out what the danger is and what to do about it uh, is really going to grab your attention. And that is, so that's not just a, a bias, let's say, in human attention uh, systems. It's something that's being very deliberately exploited in a way, uh, you know, in what your 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 feedback is on your on your social media accounts or whatever. Uh, so I'm just saying that these these dynamics in this case, which is we, we've got brain dynamics, we have adaptive dynamics, and we have very deliberate um, economic strategy and marketing strategy that is skillfully capitalizing on that. So I see that as part of the particular toxic moment, let's say that we're we're at. Yeah, I, I agree with that, but I'm not sure. 
I, I have a feeling that it was always thus. I mean, if you if you go back in the 19th century, you'll, you'll find these things, uh, you know. Um, so yeah, I, I, but I, I don't necessarily think that fear mongering trumps, if you'll pardon the expression, uh, trumps uh, touching moments. I mean, there's many things on the internet, that, you know, there's, there's kittens and, <laughs> you know, cats taking care of ducks and, you know, all this stuff, yeah. you know, that people do watch. And I would say, so I got, my publisher said, you know, I said, are you going to get me on uh, NPR? No, no, no. Are you going to get me? No, 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 no. He, my editor, who I like a lot, said, get on Twitter. So when the book came out, I got on Twitter and I spent, you know, an inordinate, inordinate amount of time on it because it, it does give these little stupid pulses. Um, but, um, I, so I put out a lot of my social commentary as tweets. I, I find the, uh, the format actually quite fun. You know, you can, you can say something succinctly and, and see what people say to it. And I would say, um, I've been doing this for two years and um, I, I'm getting better at it, but I have had very little uh, pushback. I mean, of course, uh, it feeds me the people who agree with me and so on, but over the time, um, I, I think it's been sustaining. My effort has been sustaining to the people who do follow me and see what I'm, what, what's Sterling going to say today to encourage us, basically. And um, so, and one of the things that it allowed me to do was that um, I live in Panama now. This is where I'm talking to you from P Panama. And um, so I tweeted in Spanish. Uh, about the book and I occasionally tweet, you know, I tweet the birds from Panama and I tweet, you know, various things. And uh, so I get up, I have a following in, in Argentina and Chile and Mexico and, and so on. Uh, and uh, so I am about to bring out the book in a Spanish translation. I, I, I got the MIT gave me the rights and. Nice. Oops. Uh, in Argentina, two uh, physicians who helped clean up the translation and they got to publicize it and so on. So I think mm -hmm. the internet can work in our favor. Um, yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. I, I have to say, tweeting birds seems like totally opposite. I, it's like finally Twitter found its true calling. Exactly. But anyway, so uh, Elizabeth, please, do you want to uh, uh, read us or tell us your, your comment and question? Yes, thank you. And I'm based in, in the US and Arizona. so. I apologize in some way, <laughs> um, but actually this is a good segue because I, I'm thinking about uh, time and how we spend our time. And I'm just wondering how we can advocate for policies to take what, what you're saying um, into account and really promote art and music and things that you know we value, but people may not have time for if you're working two shifts, if there's no childcare, you, know, you mentioned salt and thinking about diet. Um, I'm just curious if you or others have examples of how we can, you know, how does this move forward for the, you know, I, I'm not a neuroscientist. So how does it move forward for the people who are thinking about um, putting these into practice and, and, and working with people in communities who, who do value, you know, uh, sacred practices, but may not have the resources, may not have the time, may not have um, the ability to, to practice these. So thank you. Uh, well, I, I, you know, I don't have anything special. I, I take my time that I don't need to brush my teeth and uh, wash my clothes, uh, cook my dinner, and I, I spend it on these sorts of things. Right now, I am actually uh, involved in a, uh, we're building a park. Uh, one of my friends bought a lot of land along the river south of town, and uh, it's 20 acres, and his dream was to make Central Park, you know, a fancy, you know, real back to nature. And I happen to have uh, learned a lot about the trees here. And so he asked me to choose the trees for his park. And so, uh, so that's what I'm doing. And, uh, and then he says, well, how are we going to afford to do it? And I said, well, I'm going to pay for that. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't need very much money now. I have enough money to do that. And a lot of things, public things that need to be done, people say, well, who's going to pay for that? Well, you know, uh, a lot of us have money that, you know, we could well afford to, to spend on that. I, so that's what I do. My wife works in hospice. Uh, 
She, for a while, worked in a, a group called Buenos Vecinos, who were taking food to uh, poor people. Uh, and um, so, you know, there, there's, there's, not, there's so many, you know, there's an infinity of possible community activities. Uh, somebody just has to get them started. And then, you know, I mean, you've got to, you got to hustle them. I, I just made friends with a, a guy my age who's got some money and is interested in this park. You know, uh, I've invited him to help. You know, so I, I there's, there's no end to it. You know, and you just need a couple of people to join together and get started. You know? Yeah, and these are not necessarily insights that we need to get from neuroscience. I mean, oh, there's other, yeah. other good reasons for saying this is how to live a good life, kind of. But, but it's nice when, when we have a, a other arguments for people who say, oh, but that's, that's not well grounded in, in human nature or something like that. Yeah, so that, you know, that's what I feel is my job right now is I, I know this stuff, you know, and I'm, I know as much about it as anybody. And I have spent the time trying to get down to what human nature looks like, really, you know, and uh, uh, the book has been read by a bunch of anthropologists and so on. So I, I feel like I, I should be saying this to people. It's not, it's not your brain. It's not, it's not some little molecule you're missing. No, it's, this is, we got to take our lives back, you know. Yeah, this is so relevant to, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of our immediate concerns here is having gotten involved with this very large neuroscience research program at McGill, which is centered on neuroinformatics and big data, but which includes all kinds of other lines of work. And that as one of its products hopes to generate something called the Canadian Framework for Brain Health, uh, which is gonna have all kinds of recommendations for policy and so on. And I ended up chairing this process, which is a bit ironic, although I have some undergraduate training in neuroscience and what at the time was called physiological psychology with uh, Ron Melzack and Donald Hebb and other people. But, uh, but my orientation now is very much, um, you know, about human beings as social beings and how we optimize that level of our, uh, of our existence. So, right. so it's an interesting challenge then to say, okay, so if, if we put that in dialogue with the best available neuroscience, what would neuroscience look like and what would our policy look like? In sure. Um, well, that, yeah, that's great. I, I just published a, a paper in uh, JAMA Psychiatry. I don't know if you saw it. Um, uh, with uh, Michael Platt, who was a, a physiological psychologist, uh, primatologist, uh, you know, dopamine guy. And, and basically, um, it, 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 it takes up this death of despair and, and, um, and, and it lays out, and, and I show this curve of the human life cycle, and it points out that, you know, we've lost, we've lost the grandparents, we've lost the parents, we're down to one parent taking care of a child, 25% uh, of children in the US are growing up with one parent. It's not, it's not feasible. You can't do it. Even if you can give them calories, you really can't take care of them in a proper way. So, so I would say, uh, if you don't have that, I, I will send you, in fact, I, for, I'd be grateful if you'd share my email links with, with your community, and I will send you the, uh, the, uh, the uh, JAMA piece, if you don't have it, uh, I, would, think that, yeah. I think that would be helpful, actually. That would be great. I have I have the JAMA piece, but I, I won't I won't put it in the um, in the chat right now. But but please do send it to us and we'll make sure it gets to everyone. And okay. again, if we if we end up putting this talk up um, with your permission, then we would also put it up with links to the appropriate resources. So people right. who want to follow up on it have a have a quick way to get to that stuff. So. <laughs> Uh, and, and I think, you know, we may well take you up on your offer to uh, go through your book uh, a bit more systematically, um, because there's so much in there that, as I say, because part of our challenge now is to um, really to say something that's meaningful to two audiences, to an audience of neuroscientists who are often focused in a much, you know, a much more, uh, what can we say, circumscribed way in trying to uh, unpack very particular mechanisms and understand how they work, which is, you know, important, exciting work. And well, then policy people who are saying, but what can we do now? What's the wisest thing to do now with what we have available? And also as new findings come out, how do we, 
how do we digest those in a sensible way? Because as you know, again, the way the game works is things tend to get oversold at a certain point because that's how you get the next grant and that's how everybody tells you you're doing a good job. So we, you know, we need something in between, a filter in between or a translation process in between that is uh, conducive to a certain kind of wisdom about things. So. Yeah, I, I agree. That's absolutely what, what we need. So anything I can do to help, I will do. Uh, I think that article is a start, but I, you know, this is what I do now. <laughs> Super. Uh, Stephanie's had her hand up. Sorry, Stephanie, for a while. Do you want to? Uh... Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, thank you so much uh, for this talk. I I was been reflecting upon um, what you brought up that to you know we have with our lovely large brains, mental distress that comes with it, and interpersonal conflict. And to benefit from each other, we need to cohere. Um, and I'm just struck that because we have a lot of siloed conversations these days with how fast information travels and with the internet, we've lost a lot of shared symbols and shared practices. And I, I struggle to imagine a way for us to, to cohere with the heterogeneity that we have. Uh, you know, I can make room for people who have traditions that don't mean something to me. I love that, but it does take me significant cognitive um, input to to understand because it's not something that is a simple tradition that is from my background and i think that we've lost monoculture which i'm glad for all the conversations that is brought up but we're not watching the same thing at the same time we're not reading the same thing at the same time because we can access it all at different points um, so i'm wondering what you might have to say about coming together with symbols and traditions that might not really mean the same thing to all of us. Right, yeah, that, that's a very good question. I, um, I thought about that and, uh, um, you know, um, uh, people, people say, you know, um, so Passover, Passover is uh, coming up, it's, to, it's tomorrow. And um, so what people say at the end of Passover, it's, it's, it's a celebration around here. I explain to what world was Passover. I say it's the Ultima Sena, it's the Last Supper. And oh, they get that. Um, for, in the Christian tradition. So um, the, uh, the thing is, these are all different. Uh, uh, cult cultures, and you know, each one of us is attached to one or the other. But the fact is, what the I think the most amazing stuff from the human genome that's coming out now is all of these sequencing of regional uh, genomes across the planet. And so now they can trace. You know, when we left Africa at fifty thousand years ago, only maybe. 50,000 years into our speciesood, we got to Indonesia in no time. We, from Indonesia, we used stone axes to carve, you know, wooden boats to get to Australia and New Guinea. I mean, uh, then we went up over the Siberian land bridge. And what the genome studies are showing now is it wasn't just one group that came across that land bridge. There was wave after wave after wave coming down to Panama, crossing the isthmus here uh, into South America. There was, there was do a dozen uh, of these uh, groups and they all mixed, they all integrate, you know, uh, with each other. And so, uh, so now we find, if you ask anybody who's done their, their 23 and me, they say, yeah, I'm 3% Askanaji Jew. I'm, Two percent Neanderthal, and so on. So, the point is, at, at the end of at the end of Passover, people say uh, next year in in Jerusalem, next year in Israel. And so this was uh, an important thing for this group. But um, you know, I I think about this now. The, the, what genetic science shows is that uh, uh, home was always someplace else. You know, we always, everybody came from someplace else. And this is true since our species left Africa. So I think we should sort of forget, not forget, but, uh, you know, we can do without, um, we can celebrate each other's uh, holidays. And, and, and we have, I think we have over the millennia 
have merged these these traditions uh, in, in, in various rich ways. Thank you're, you. you're describing uh, what some people would call a cosmopolitan uh, view, which, you know, uh, which I personally subscribe to very much. And I think, again, there are historical and cultural reasons for that being a sensible way of thinking of humanity. But uh, some of my work is with indigenous peoples who are very rooted to a particular place Sure. Uh, who understand that's what it is to be human in a way. Uh, and uh, again, I, I mean, I think it's, it's important for our collective diversity, but it also po poses challenges uh, because then there are struggles over who, you know, whose place is this and how do we incorporate the other. And, and again, putting in the largest possible frame because of climate change and so on, we know we're on the, on the cusp of you know, the largest migrations, forced migrations, uh, mm -hmm. probably in human history, and we're ill-equipped right now to respond uh, morally to, to those, so. Right, yeah, no, I, it's very it's very challenging, you know, but we have to be clear that uh, human beings moved across, moved through each other's cultures, interbred, and and uh, we have to reject the idea that um, purity is some, uh, something meaningful. And I think even with the indigenous people here and in Canada, um, I mean, we live in a community of indigenous people here, uh, and our the family lives on our farm. Still speak their language, but their and their children do, but their children's children won't. And uh, we are helping the children on the farm move from the uh, the uh, life they were born on the Camarca, the reserve. They came down. The families come down to do uh, the uh, harvest, the coffee harvest, and so we have we've been here eighteen years, and so the kids that were born on our farm are now <laughs> ready for university. And we are helping them do that because they're not going to make a living the way their father did, you know, and their mother did. So they have to, uh, they have to study, they have to learn English. Uh, uh, they've been pretty slow to do it, but now they're realizing that this is important. Uh, and uh, so, and, and the whole community has changed immensely in, in, the, in the 20 years that we've, we've been here. So, yeah, those are real. Those are real challenges, and that's happening all all over the world. You know, definitely. Uh, but but I don't think that neuroscience has much to offer that. Uh, you know, except to say, you know, the very general things that I've tried to say. This is this is sort of. I think the most important thing that I am saying now is that our brain came from a worm, and we're using the same circuit, and you're not going to fix it by some something you know that doesn't need fixing is our, our brains are not broken really uh and that's what i'm saying about addiction our brains are just not broken they just need better care i mean our minds need better care that's it i think that's a very helpful uh apothem to end on um and uh i just want to thank you for a tremendously stimulating and thought-provoking and in some ways profound discussion so i i really really appreciate you taking the time and as i say we're, we're probably going to take you up on ask for a bit more of your time and hopefully continue this this conversation it's, so. it's a pleasure to talk to people uh who are interested as you are and you know and are thinking about we're we're all on you know on a similar page and we need to support each other. So thank you. Uh, I, I received support from this as well. And so I'm anxious to to share it. And thank yeah, you for, I'm, sorry, yeah. sorry for my confusion. <laughs> Not at all. It's worked out fine. And, and I, I think as Elizabeth made this comment, appreciating the optimism, and I do have to say that's one of the things that is very um, encouraging about your, your own, you know, the way you're living your life, have lived your life, the way in what you're expressing now is an optimism at a moment when, you know, one only, only has to read the, the headlines in New York Times to feel kind of pessimistic. So uh, it's very helpful. Yeah. Okay, thank you again thank you. for the presentation. I hope to see you all again before too long. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.